Now for the penultimate session of the day, we have a business leader who is an eminent media and advertising professional with three decades of experience across Southeast Asia and India. Uh, please welcome Anupriya Acharya, our CEO of Publicist Group, South Asia. A seasoned leader with over 18 years in the CXO roles across WPP, Aegis and Publicis, she is also an active industry influencer. She holds positions on, uh, on boards of multiple organizations. She has been recognized in Fortune magazine's most powerful women in the business for three consecutive years. Like, that is amazing. Uh, she's been on the list of um, um, on most powerful women in business list for 2023 as well, and also the Forbes W Power Trailblazer. She's arguably one of India's most powerful persons in Indian media. Thank you so much, and uh, stage is yours. Thank you thank so Thank you much. very much. Thank you. Thank you for the glowing words, and thank you for the warm welcome. So before I start, I want to say a big thank you to all the organizers over here for having me over at Praxis. I'm really privileged to be here, and I'm very excited uh, to be speaking on the topic that I've got, which is the impact of media. I've gone ahead and given away. All right, so it's, it's not coming over here, so I'll have to look back. Um, so my topic today is impact of media in shaping consumers and be consumer behaviors and communities. It's a very, very vast topic. I'm going to try and cover it in 15, 20 minutes for you. Um, and, and so hence, uh, uh, it's, it's going to take some time. Um, for the younger audience over here, I thought it was important that I paint the contrast of the world that you're used to with the media which was there earlier and how over centuries media has actually shaped consumer behavior and, and communities just so that you will appreciate the contrast better and, and we can uh, get on with that. So uh, just bear with me. I'm going to go a little in the past. Uh, for some of you who might know these pictures, these are town criers. I'm talking about a time way before mass media really got, was there. And this is how announcements happen. And if you can see, these people used to be very ostentatiously dressed. Uh, so they used to create a lot of uh, noise and drama. And that is how they used to gather attention. And there were like tens and hundreds of people who would come over there and they would announce what was important at that point in time. Maybe a leader had passed away. Maybe there was some change in uh, leadership. Maybe there were new taxes which were coming up. And since I'm from advertising, I also want to talk uh, tell you that this was also an opportunity for them to talk about new shops that had opened, new products that had come in, and any product that had gone uh, you know, out of circulation if it was back in stock. So there was a little bit of advertising also in this whole uh, you know, media or, or sort of word of mouth that used to be there at that point in time. Quickly, many centuries ahead, uh, uh, this is when the printing press got invented in the mid-14th century, uh, and you had the Gutenberg Bible, uh, which was landmark uh, event of that time. And by the mid 16th century, you started getting newspapers in their early forms. Uh, and that really democratized how people got information and views on social and uh, religious and political issues. And what was only with the few and, and far between people suddenly was accessible to a lot of people. What it did is provide uh, access to a lot of these news and views of the world to a lot of people at the same time. So instead of tens and hundreds of people, now you could reach with this um, hundreds of thousands of people all at the same time. And obviously the popularity of it grew and we saw that it moved the society forward uh, and, and shaped communities of that time. Since I'm from advertising, I quickly want to touch upon uh, with the advent of real mass media of those times, Advertising latched onto it quite quickly, and companies and institutions found it very useful to be able to sell their products and talk about stories of their products through the medium of print. And what started as very little inserts right at the end of the newspaper, very quickly to today's, we have seen a lot of times newspapers having more advertising really uh, than news over there. Surely it works, and surely it shapes consumer uh, behavior. Otherwise, nobody would be putting all this money. The key point for you to know, for some of the uninitiated, essentially is that there is a role that all these advertising dollars have played over centuries to ensure the freedom of press, 
and fiercely independent journalism because great newsrooms and great news editors and, and, and uh, news desks, they a, cost a lot of money. And so there, there has been a role for advertising uh, over there beyond shaping the economy. And so it has played its role both in shaping the culture as well as well as, well as uh, moving the society and economy forward. Cut to many centuries later, this is my time, the mid-80s, when we were, you know, television came into the fray. Uh, first black and white, then colored, first only Doordarshan, then of course a plethora of cable and satellite channels in the mid-90s. And that truly really transformed uh, the society because suddenly you had, uh, when we called mass media, it took mass, mass, the meaning of mass to another level altogether. From suddenly, from hundreds of thousands of people, you could reach millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. So today, TV reaches more than 800 million people over here in this uh, market. That's the kind of reach. And the other thing that, so it gave a lot of efficient reach to a lot of, uh, you know, so it again started shaping the society in a little different manner than what print did. Because television had the ability of audio-visual storytelling. Uh, and that really set it apart from print because uh, print was largely focused on news and views and possibly more on the serious matters. But the way the television really grasped, uh, connected emotionally and, and grasped the imagination of a whole, whole sort of society it was unprecedented. And so some of the most popular uh, content of those times actually became a very, very, uh, you know, a very large in its space. And some of the biggest superstars were created in this era, essentially because of the kind of reach that it had. Uh, it, and also because people, uh, obviously, the other thing was that, you know, you didn't really have to be literate to participate in that. It was audiovisual storytelling. And then the regionalization and the vernacularization and the, the niche content that started coming on television, it took a life of its own, and it grew, grew fast and furious at that point in time. So some of the, big, the best stories of the times were made on TV, told on TV, and those narratives really shaped a whole society. And similarly, some of the most... Uh, Iconic brands, this was also an era of iconic brands because of the kind of reach that television provided from north to south to east to west, urban, semi-rural, rural, everywhere. Uh, and so some of the largest brands that have been created still hold strong today. And you will be happy to know that these large selling brands, which are largest selling in India, are also some of the largest selling in the world, be it chocolates, be it biscuits, be it soaps, be it two-wheelers. That was the power of television. Quickly, now I come to today, and then came the digital world, what we call as the digital era. We all are all aware that um, uh, accessible and affordable smartphones and data uh, spread like wildfire because everything that digital, digital can do, and it has transformed the way uh, right now. A lot of you are on your mails or calls or messages. Uh, so it has really transformed the way people behave, the, people, the way people shop, the way people bank, uh, and everything. And today it reaches more than 800 million people uh, in India as well, and there are eight, 20 million active internet uh, users as, as we speak today. Now that's a lot of reach, and that's as mass as it gets. So in its own right, it is a mass media. But that's not really what it is all about. The new order is not only about the fact that it has reached that level of um, you know, the popularity, the more important part on digital is that it has transformed our lives and it has transformed media and entertainment that the way we were used to it. One, it is interactive, so it lets you respond in real time. So from a broadcast uh, life, now our lives are more like, you know, if I have an opinion, I can also share it. So if you are telling me something, I can tell you immediately at that point in time what exactly are my views and what exactly are my opinion. And so I can play games online, I can interact with other people, I can tell uh, people with opinions as to what my opinion is, what my standing is on, on all of that. So that. And the other thing is it's also promoted a world of platforms and applications where people are logged in all the time on your mails, on maps, uh, on searches, uh, on quick commerce. You get up in the morning, you start using all of this. Because of which, all of these have a lot of data around you. They know, know what age cohort you are, what is your locality, what is your preferred language, what are you searching, what do you like, 
Uh, so they know a lot about you, and hence they ensure that you are served more and more and more of the same. Now, that has truly disrupted the way it has shaped consumer behavior because everything is very personalized. So we live in a world where five people in the room, uh, earlier when they were watching TV, they were watching the same content. But if five people in the room are on the same uh, sort of social uh, site, they will be served different content and they could be viewing and, and interacting with very different things at the same time. So it's become a very individualized, very personalized world and it is highly interactive. So that's the new order where we are living in a world of feeds and posts and tweets and reels. Uh, and in this world, uh, you know, there is this new order that we are talking about. You will be happy. I just want to touch upon, touch upon this because a lot of people ask this. The old holds steady. India is a world of and. So when television came in, print continued to grow, and television grew as well. And similarly, when digital has come in, there is a lot of time which gets spent on that. That time comes from somewhere else, not necessarily only. So it's not either or, it is a land of and, and in the foreseeable future, all, all projections are essentially that everything will continue to grow. Yes, of course, some faster than the others, and some are on, the, on a lower base than the others. So I, I just wanted to clear that. Uh, moving on, I just want to now take a few minutes to talk about Gen Z. And I have a very timely uh, research report which has, which has uh, come in just in time for this. Uh, so there is this whole, uh, when we talk about this whole behavior change and consumers' attitudes and habits changing, I want to draw a con contrast, uh, you know, because we are not talking, I don't want to talk averages right now. So people like me, for example, in a fully digital world with all, all the screens that we have, I get up in the morning and I still read the newspaper. Though I may not use television for entertainment, I've moved on to tablets. And then there are people who are actually watching uh, TV, uh, but they are consuming news online. And, and, but it is not about people like us. It is about the people who are going to be shaping the society in a few years from now. They're already shaping the society. Gen Z. Are, are the cohort which are currently uh, in their teens to all the way up to 27. And every, so it's a sizable, um, a sizable number of people. There are close to 350 million people. And it, it is a pretty large cohort, almost 30% of our population. Every year, 30 million more people are joining the workforce. So it is something that, we, that really counts. Uh, and the other thing that really makes them stand apart is they are very unique. When we have gotten used to digital over a period of time, uh, and so we, we can sort of you know flip in and flip out of these worlds easily. But the Gen Z that we are talking about, they are digital natives. They have grown up in a world where they have always had personalized attention uh, from media and the way they interact with it. They have grown up in that world, and so it is second nature to them. And so we wanted to decode it a little further. Why I call it a timely report is we wanted to understand the uh, the usage and attitude with certain categories. So we, we, we worked on um, some six categories, out of which one happens to be media, which is why I'm calling it extremely timely. So it talks about their uh, usage and attitude around media today, and, and uh, it's a pretty robust uh, research, both quality and quantity is there. So I'll just give, give you a quick flavor of. First of all, no surprises that they are every day on media. Uh, and 95% uh, are always on media. I don't know who are these 5% who are not on media every day. Not only every day, but like few times in a day and possibly many hours. Uh, their association with, with media is very interesting. The spon the, the, their spontaneous association clearly talks about, uh, they think of media as enjoyable, uh, it is entertaining. It's very convenient because everything is present at the tap of a button. Uh, they enjoy the distinction and the variety of, uh, of topics that are covered over there. No matter what is their orientation, they are able to find a community and they are able to find diverse uh, sort of topics. Uh, the speed with which it is served to them, the dynamism, and, and of course the opportunity to interact socially and the social activism. Uh, moving on. All right. 
So uh, again, no surprises, social media is a primary medium of media consumption, followed by television and OTT. On social media, they are largely, uh, you know, they, they look at it as a place for self-expression. They are able to build communities that they want to be part of, which are as, as part of their uh, interest. Uh, and they look at these places to build connections, to voice their opinions, and to listen to other people's opinion. And so majority of the time goes over here, and that's definitely one big area that they spend their time on. Uh, the other is the OTT. Uh, what they really like over here is the variety of content, uh, long form content which is present over there. So no matter what is their inclination and what is their orientation and uh, you know, their unique uh, sort of area that they enjoy, uh, they are able to find content and the libraries are pretty wide enough to be able to accommodate all, all kinds of. So this is a recurring theme that people want to really uh, sort of, uh, you know, there is content for enough, and this is what sets this apart from the television era, where it was a broadcast era, and there was this mainstream content that was served to everyone. Uh, and of course, television, they use, usually use for uh, live sports and live events and reality TV, uh, and of course, also spending time with the family. So television is not dead for sure. Uh, on, on media, they, they are, for them, the key vectors are, uh, how original is the content? This is an underlying theme keeps coming constantly. They care more about originality rather than, you know, replica of the same content being regurgitated again and again. Humor and entertainment, funny things that can take away the mind from, um, you know, stresses that they have. Uh, they love innovative formats where they can sort of, you know, say augmented reality and they can get new experiences. Uh, the diversity of the content I just spoke about and they really care about social impact, so they do like to, uh, on, in media they also find uh, areas which, which help them with their uh, social impact uh, sort of ambitions. Uh, no surprises, 70% prefer short form content given they have, obviously everybody has low attention spans and everybody's in a hurry. Incidentally, interestingly, YouTube is a college, they have their own distinct forms of learning and they look to uh, YouTube for learning a lot of these, uh, which is not surprising because the amount of how-to videos which are there uh, on YouTube is not funny. So whichever area they want to query further, learn about, so it is, in sorts, it's college. And the most important part that you should know, and it was, was very interesting for me, is their thirst for authenticity. Majority of them believe that social media gives them the right news. This was like a revelation for me. And they do not look at TV and print for that because they feel that it's a bit con convoluted and overhyped. And they believe that social media gives them the right sort of information and news because they are able to go through all the comments below and decide on their own how, you know, what side to take on. They get to know all the views. It's a discussion and they can make up their own mind and views on the topic that they are, you know, interested in and further querying. And even in terms of authenticity, they find social media way better than television and print. So all of you should wake up. All of us should wake up. And hence, because of that thirst for, thirst for authentic, authenticity, obviously they also find the TV reality shows pretty boring and scripted and, and a bit contrived. So that's not surprising. Uh, and now I'll just rattle through some of these things. You are all aware of this the impact that it is having. I have already painted you the contrast of the print world, press world, and then the television world. So obviously here entertainment is all in short format. There is a dopamine loop. They don't necessarily look for content coming only from superstars or celebrities. They are, they like original content. And so for example, something like, uh, you know, just like a wow caught everybody's attention because it, it was so vivacious and, and spoken in the right sort of spirit. Uh, so it didn't have to be like this perfect thing that, that is doing the rounds. Uh, and then there are these hook steps and, and many other things. And a lot of these are created by average people like you and me around and not necessarily celebrate. So originality, virality, the dopamine loop, all of that becomes important, important for entertainment. On experiences, of course, experiences are very big. This is a generation that doesn't, doesn't care too much for owning things as much as for experiences. And they look to content, both short form, long form, to inspire them. And so you would be aware that a show like Emily in Paris generated more than 200% uh, interest uh, in some of the hotspots which are shown over there. And similarly, we all know Squid Games, uh, the amount of interest it generated in Seoul. 
uh, and the K-drama that is happening and the food trends that are happening around that. Uh, so it, it uses media also to inspire them for experiences. Um, uh, and then we talked about breaking stereotypes and how they want content to be uh, sort of, yes, so they want content essentially to be, uh, you know, highlighting areas that matter to them. So content which is talking about, you know, things which are not mainstream, say surrogacy or talking about LGBTQ or talking about modern themes. Uh, so that's, that's very popular and, and they find acceptance through that kind of content and media. And of course, the media is also a catalyzer for there where you can shape public opinion uh, and ensure you, we all know the rise of the citizen journalists where they are able to whip up a lot of support when there are any protests going on. Uh, and this is something that is becoming bigger and bigger and people believe that social impact can be created from uh, that as well. Uh, quickly moving on, on influencers, they believe a lot, in short, they believe a lot in influencers and they follow the ones that they find authentic in line with their own aspirations, in line with what they are searching for. So they find their own, they will decide who they will get influenced by. And yes, influencers also impact the, uh, you know, what things they buy, how they dress, where they go to eat and all of that. So they do have a lot of, they look to them for trends and interesting uh, tidbits and, and content and all of that and we all know all the very very uh, you know famous influencers talking about current affairs talking about um, uh, you know life advice and things like that and it is not surprising which is why influencer marketing is so much on the rise and continues to rise quite dramatically gaming is another area that I wanted to quickly touch upon because it's already more close to 500 million people uh, interestingly a lot of people look at gamers and feel that you know, okay, they are in their own world and, you know, they are solo people. They are not solo people. They are actually using gaming to connect with people, to collaborate with people, making new friends. It's a place that where they are going to hang out and a lot of gaming gets used to it. In, 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 uh, incidentally, I picked up this statistic that only 47% of the time allocated uh, to video games is spent playing. A lot, more than half of that time is spent on reading reviews, uh, following their influ gaming influencers, purchasing stuff related to that, fandom, uh, and all of that. Uh, so gaming is essentially for connection and community, and not really for, uh, you know, only just doing your own gaming experience. And this is another area which is already large and pretty, moving pretty fast. Uh, lastly, I want to, I cannot close this session without talking about ChatGPT and its Tremendous rise in less than two years' time. Uh, it has now 600 million visits monthly, I understand, and there are 180 million users. More importantly, it is their new Messiha. They are finding uh, a soulmate in, in, in uh, AI, and there is this whole bro code uh, where they are very comfortable sharing uh, their views and thoughts, you know, and areas that they would not, may not be comfortable talking to other people. They are pretty up and about, and they believe that ChatGPT understands them very well, and uh, you know, same nuances, same language, and all of that. So that's an interesting trend uh, which is picking up, and so it is not surprising that there are a lot of AI uh, companions that are on the rise, like uh, Replica and Anima, and this is a new area, but clearly from the looks of it, at least in the initial stages, it looks like that it is here to stay, and people are definitely using them as uh, AI companions. Uh, so, through this talk, I just wanted to quickly, you know, uh, show you and, and demonstrate to you how society has been shaped a lot by the way media behaves and the kind of content that media is able to carry. So we saw in the age of print vis-a-vis -vis the age of television, which was mostly, you know, ensured huge uh, reach as well as uh, emotional connect to the age of digit, digit, uh, uh, to the digital age where it is all about interactivity and hence authenticity uh, and the fact that the, you know, boundaries between what is real, what is fake, who is an expert, who is not an expert, all of those boundaries are blurring. So it is, it is, these are interesting times that we stay in. And of course, it throws up a lot of points to ponder uh, the polarization, the impact on mental, mental health, the impact on physical health, limited skill development, uh, you know, the ability to concentrate, uh, addictive behavior, algorithmic-driven uh, uh, biases, 
and all of this. So these are areas definitely which are also in the fray, apart from the fact that it has made our life very convenient uh, and definitely has given us a lot of entertainment and, and you know, newer areas uh, and newer communities that never existed. But of course, there are points to pan ponder. We have to remember that media is extremely powerful in shaping uh, communities and consumer behavior. And so for all of us in this room, we must remember with great power comes great responsibility, how we tread this in the coming uh, years and the coming centuries. Uh, a lot depends on people in this room and in our, in our uh, fraternity. So those, those, that's, that's what I wanted to share with you. And with that, Arun, I'll be happy to. Thanks a lot, Anupriya. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of findings there, uh, a lot of stats. Very interesting, I thought. Um, and a lot that we can discuss. So I'll ask you a few questions. Um, so a cu couple of the findings that I thought were really interesting to begin with were, first of all, you, you described India uh, as a market, an and market. So you, you have the rise of digital media, but it's not necessarily happening at the expense of traditional mediums like uh, print and TV. But at the same time, when you look at the Gen Z findings, um, they are actually, uh, they, they demonstrate that they see more authenticity in social media. And indeed, even in, kind, you know, in terms of reading comments mm -hmm. on social media posts, which I, you know, might alarm many people in this room. So how do you balance um, those two findings, particularly as it relates to the future uh, of traditional media in terms of how uh, reliable it is and perhaps how attractive it is uh, as a medium for brands? Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we have seen, that's, that's the reason I also wanted to go back a little in history and cover how eras have gone and, and how media has evolved. Uh, the thing is that with each era, uh, and, and whatever the technology be of that time, whether it is a printing press, visa we wear, whether it is algorithms. Uh, the thing is that, the, you know, there is a need for um, platforms, there is a need for sharing views, there's a need for uh, advertising, there's a need for shaping uh, thoughts and, and, and cultures. Uh, so whatever be, be in that, era, whatever be the uh, so-called technology, uh, People will find, human beings will find a way to connect and human beings will find a way to, um, you know, exchange ideas, exchange views. And so when we talk about the mass media and its future, uh, we already see that it is also evolving. It is not still in time. It's not like, it, today print is not what it used to be when, it's, when, when, when it started. And television is no longer, longer what it was. So it is already starting to cater to very sort of, um, uh, you know, diverse uh, sort of interests, uh, knowing fully well where the consumer is headed. Um, so it's not media the way we speak of it in terms of like, you know, it's, it's not the pipe which really matters. It's also the content and the content creators. And yes, it is interesting that now, of course, there is more co-creation. Um, but I think the media as it stands, the traditional media as we call it, or the old that we call it, is also evolving. So it's not really old, it also is constantly uh, updating itself with the changing trends. So, so you, you, you see new types of content emerging. Um, and one of the things you flagged was, um, so for example, gaming, um, but also how uh, younger people are creating new communities, different communities, um, even, you know, there's, there's cultures, there's subcultures now as well. Um, and presumably, brands that you're advising um, or that your agencies are advising uh, are very keen to be part of these subcultures. And many already are, I think, perhaps successfully um, engaging with people uh, in these communities and, and cultures. Um, but, but it... You know, one thing that often occurs to me is that uh, these kinds of, of communities and cultures require long-term investment um, from, from companies and from brands. Um, so how do they balance that with, of course, this kind of relentless pressing desire for short-term commercial returns as well? 
Uh, quarterly results, you mean, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm a firm believer that you have to be uh, meeting all your short-term requirements if you have to be there for the long term. There is no long term without the short term. So it is, you know, this whole um, argument between, you know, should we look at balancing this long term thing and hence, you know, we should not uh, invest in the short term or le let's not sort of cut short whatever because the long term brand building or, uh, or, or uh, communication or, you know, it's very important. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I think it is important that if only, only if you are there in the short term, will you stay 10 years and 100 years. But if you're not there, oh, and, and even more important today, where people are sort of moving from one thing to the other very quickly, if you're not there for in the short term, if you're not winning in the short term, there's no way that you will win in the long term. So, you, you know, the strategies that you have today have to, uh, win in the short term, and then, of course, on top of that, you layer, uh, like I said, uh, and market. So it is not either or. It is, you know, the short term and the long term, and the short term is as as significant and important as the long term. But but I just wonder, do you do you think brands are willing to uh, relinquish, you know, um, a measure of commercial success in the short term in order to build stronger relationships in the long term? Uh, Whether brands are willing to relinquish a measure of commercial success in the short term in order to build longer rela uh, stronger relationships in the long term? Uh, increasingly fine. I mean, we work with a lot of, uh, a lot of clients and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, and everywhere. Uh, I think it is extremely uh, sort of, uh, it, it's clear to everyone that it is important to win in the short run as well. Uh, so all the strategies that are being created, whether it is in communication, whether it is in advertising, whether it is in media, uh, they always keep the short term in, in the... In fact, I remember in my growing up years, uh, you know, we used to look at annual plans and everything was done at a once in a year. Uh, you know, used to come together and look at what research is suggesting and then, you know, hence what are, you know, what are your strengths and what are your strategies. Uh, those days are long gone, like, you know, these days you have to constantly be looking at the data signals that are coming all the time and decoding them and finding ways to ensure that you are ahead of the curve. So uh, I think it's, it's pretty well established with everyone that you have to win in the short term. That doesn't mean that you have to win only in the short term. So obviously the, the ethos that you carry, uh, you have to ensure that you are um, authentic, with your consumers, so there may be flavors of the season and you will be around, but you are also ensuring that, you, you know, you build in the long-term stability of, of your narrative. You talked about influencers, um, and of course, you know, they, they, the, the followings that they have built, um, and I think we're all aware in this room now that brands are spending, uh, in some cases, you know, enormous amounts of, of money with influencers, um, with creators. Uh, is there a risk that it's becoming commoditized? Um, and uh, is there, uh, you know, one of the criticisms we hear, particularly in the public relations community, um, is that media agencies are partly to blame for this kind of commoditization of influences. And I wonder how you would respond to that. Um, so I would definitely say that this is a new area. Um, that being said, I think uh, actually a lot of agencies are in that space. It's not only the media agencies. So you have the media agencies, you have the PR agencies, you have the creative agencies. Uh, all are trying to decode this space because there is no ignoring it. You can't ignore it any longer. And uh, I would say that's good because it, what it has done, it has scaled up that whole industry, uh, made, it, made it more sort of organized, decoded it. Uh, and, and really changed its level from like one little disorganized sector to a more organized, uh, uh, you know, place now. And because of which the good thing is that, you know, I touched upon in my talk, um, you know, the whole thing of advertising funding uh, a large part of, you know, um, freedom of press. And in some manner, it's the same thing. So influence, influencers, and this profession is not an easy one. Like at one such forum, I was listening to some young influencers, and this girl was saying that she gets up at 4 a.m. in the morning. There's a whole team 
which, you know, scripts and, and then, you know, they shoot it the whole day and it's not as easy as it, it looks to us, effortless as it looks to us. So obviously it costs a lot of money. So it is not that anybody is forcing the influencers for everything. They also realize that, uh, you know, they can find partnership in brands and companies which are matching their ethos. Uh, and I think it's a win-win for everyone. So it's, it's again, as I said, so, uh, it, I think it's far away from being getting com commoditized. It is at a stage currently where people are still finding how to utilize it to its full potential. That's, that's what I believe. So I can't let you go without asking you this question because in a room of public relations people, yes. um, how do you see the future of uh, public relations versus uh, advertising and media agencies, particularly if, as you have, have mentioned, there is this requirement for companies to um, behave more authentically uh, and create more credible connections with um, younger audiences. Does that mean you see a future where uh, public relations agencies, for example, are leading the way rather than necessarily the creative or media firms? Uh, first, I think there's a lot of blurring of boundaries in today's day and age. So just like there is a blurring of boundaries between media and advertising and content, there is blurring of boundaries between creator and the, you know, wh what used to be content earlier is being created by individuals and, and vice versa. Similarly, I think there's a blurring of boundaries also in the solutions that we have to, to uh, connect with the audiences. Uh, and there is a blurring of boundaries between PR and media and creative. No longer they can be so, you know, distinctly planned separately. Uh, in fact, as, as part of leading a group which has uh, agencies across each of these verticals. So we have agencies in creative and media, increasingly what we call as the power of one. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of interdependency which is coming in in each of our lines of businesses. Uh, the, the good news is for the PR industry is that, uh, you know, this whole agenda is very close to the CEO's heart today as compared to earlier. And we find in all the reports uh, of recent times clearly show that uh, you know, the, 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 the COPCOM agenda is very close, close to the CEO. And, uh, you know, it is no longer that you can talk something in brand and advertising and do something else altogether as a company. So I think there is a blurring of boundaries and the agendas have to all sort of, you know, come together. Uh, and to that extent, I feel that it's a bright future uh, for everyone and there is no sort of dissolving of any particular line of business. It, it's just that the way of working will have to evolve as we go ahead. And it's just like I said, we move from manual planning to now always live signals. Uh, similarly, possibly, you know, looking at each vertical separately, we are going to move into an era where, you know, people are going to be co-creating and, and, and possibly working together way more. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a completely different mindset required, but I think that that's a message that people in the room will be quite happy to hear, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, are we out of time? Or one question from the, from the floor? Great, okay, any questions from the floor, please? Hello, uh, so this is Rupali Soni from On Purpose. I wanted to ask you, as you have rightly highlighted in your report as well, that Gen Zs are demanding for more authenticity and transparency. And uh, a lot of uh, paid influencers have started disclosing that this is paid content or paid collaboration on their YouTube videos. And I myself, I bypass the sponsored segment, whether they do, whereas when they do a non-sponsored uh, video or they say that this is non-sponsored, sponsored review or recommendation, I actually believe it in more. So I'm just, uh, I just wanted to understand from you that uh, how do you uh, think that this shift of like them mentioning or disclosing the paid content or paid collaboration is going to impact the effectiveness of uh, the influencer marketing or you know how, uh, what is the future of influencer marketing like this? Uh, yeah, that's my question. So, uh, you know, the, this whole thing about trying to uh, sort of uh, pass through advertising, not having, wanting to look at it, or like looking at distrust on anything which is sponsored. So, you know, I think everything is a, is, is, uh, is a, you know, everything comes at its own time. So there will also come a time. We've seen in, even in uh, overall advertising when it has happened. Increasingly, companies are also moving to being more authentic 
as I said, those era is gone that you say something on brands and as a company, or like, let's say you are advertising, you know, sustainable packaging and all of that, but on the back end as a company, you're doing something else because at the click of the button, everything is available to the, it's the same, consumer is the same as a citizen is the same as, a, um, you know, is, is the buyer of your uh, product. So I think when we talk about authenticity, that authenticity has to come at all levels. And so when companies are, uh, having their, their sort of, you know, they, they have to be very focused on the consumer and they have to be as authentic as, as anybody else. Uh, and to your point, if uh, there are equal number of people, for example, who follow influencers and, uh, you know, for example, somebody is into health and fitness, okay? And then as part of that is talking about maybe the high protein diet that they are on and what have they found useful or somebody is, say, a makeup influencer, and as part of that talks about the fact that I have used these seven things and out of this I have found these three to be useful because, but this fitted into my budget and all. We've all seen the influencer videos, right? Um, and obviously, th there is something that Gen Z is able to decode. Like, actually, I feel that we are also able to decode. We look at it and we say, oh, achha. so it doesn't matter after some time whether it is sponsored or not, as long as it is meeting my unique requirement. And if you see the, the growth in influencer marketing and the number of Gen Zs who are following those influencers, and they have gone out and actually said that, yes, their uh, bu uh, you know, buying decisions get impacted. They are actually looking for information. They are looking for influencers to talk about some of these brands and products and, and then give them advice in terms of what will be suitable for them without them having to straight away purchase it first. So I, I think that... Uh, Yes, it can come in the way of entertainment, and yes, uh, it's right for people to have some distrust on anything which is sponsored, but uh, at the same time, there's also enough content and enough sponsored content which sort of, you know, uh, eventually leads to uh, trust and, and purchases. I hope that answers your question. It was a bit long answer. Hi. Um, in the post-COVID uh, media consumption world, uh, we have seen uh, a new lease of life that has gone to the subscription-based uh, news platforms such as The Wire, The News Laundry, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and their pitch to the consumers actually runs counter to what you said, you know, their pitch to the consumers is that when advertisers pay for news, then the advertisers' interests are served. But when you pay for the news, whatever little you pay, then your interest would be saved, and that's how the news would stay free. My question to you is, how do you see this growing in the future, in the media landscape of tomorrow? How much of leverage is this going to have? Uh, very good question. So I think some of that got answered for us also through when we were decoding this whole research and trying to get into the under the skin of uh, Gen Z. Uh, and, and which is the part that I underline, clearly they are able to decode it. So, you know, when this era has come with all its challenges of, uh, you know, blurring of boundaries, uh, the thing is, it is also giving rise to people who are able to way better decode and who are not as gullible as, as earlier generations because they are also growing up in that whole sort of era where, where they, they are digital natives, they are able to make out. So to your point, uh, you know, they, they are actually, uh, are not believing in, in what used to be institutions of, you know, uh, news like the news channels and, and the newspapers. And they are more believing social influencers for exactly this reason. So the future, of course, lies in authenticity um, and this whole thing that advertisers are paying so they could be paying for the news, that's also something that people are able to decode. If people believe that, you know, the high and mighty are influencing the news, that also people are able to decode. So it's also a more aware society and, and society which is able to use all these tools and, and technology to decode for, you know, what is right and what is wrong. So I think that it, that's where the future is headed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anupriya. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thank our you. conversation. Thanks. Thank Great. you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Arun.